renegade thinkers. If you're new here, welcome. If you've been be here before, you know the drill. This is how it goes. Today's episode is from a recording of Renegade Thinkers Live, a live streaming show about hot marketing topics with not just one, but three B2B CMOs. In today's episode, you'll learn from CMOs Grant Johnson of Embers, Kevin Ruain of Precisely, and Josh Leatherman of Service Express about how to consolidate newly acquired brands whilst protecting their equity. It's a common challenge for growing companies, and it's quite easy to get wrong, even for some of the best and brightest in the B2B world. Be sure to tune in for a bevy of best practices and mistakes to avoid. Now let's get to the show. I'm your host, Drew Neiser, live from my home studio in New York City. We used to say talk is cheap, which is somewhat ironic coming from a show host. That's a pause for, for a little laughter there. But now we can safely replace that notion with the idea that capital is cheap, really cheap. Interest rates are at historic lows. SPACs are booming. If you don't know what those are, look it up. PE and VC firms seem to be flush with capital. The result is that companies are being swallowed up faster than you can say, hello, renegade thinkers. And when that happens, you end up with a stew of brands, some of which are tossed out, perhaps prematurely, while others stick around too long, clogging up your messaging. It's not an easy process with easy answers, and you can screw it up big time. As Jennifer Renault and I talked about in episode 166 of Renegade Thinkers Unite, she was at Oracle when they decided to drop the Eloqua brand from its website a few years back. And sure enough, all the Eloquins out there stopped going to the website and leads torpedoed. No doubt there is a need for brand name consolidation, but how do you do this without losing equity and the business value in the acquired companies? To address this challenge, we've got three veteran CMOs with us today. First up is Grant Johnson, CMO of Embers. He was also the CMO of Cofax a few years back and the stars of episode 31 and 32. Anyway, hey, Grant, great to see you. Hey, Drew, it's great to be here. Happy to join everyone. Uh, so... Let's start with your situation at Embers. How many brands do you have? And were all these through acquisition? Yeah, that's a great question. It took me a while actually to complete the list. We, we have seven brands. <laughs> the first company was launched, Nexania, in 2002. And over time, you mentioned the firm PE, our private equity firm, K1 Investments. They purchased an entire portfolio. And as we got uh, you know, to scale and much larger, we decided it would be more efficient to consolidate the brands under a new master brand, Imburse, which we launched in January of 2020. So you had these seven brands, and they still you still have these seven brands, and you've got Imburse on top. All right, so for the moment, we have Imburse is a, uh, is a house of brands, if you will, like P&G with, with Tide and Pampers. But it's got to be challenging to have any kind of economy of scale with so many brands, right? I mean, it, some of these are the same customers. So how are you weaning people off the original brand and, and onto Embers, if you are at all? Well, actually, it's, it's a two-part answer, Drew. The, the first part is it was a house of brands, but we, we, we had outlined – a strategy whereby we would bring our customers along the brand unification journey. So when we launched it, uh, we would say certified buy and burst or Chrome buy and burst, which is what is commonly known as an endorsed strategy, right? But we had always intended that over time it would be a master brand. So fast forward one year from launch of January 2020, in January of this year, we launched the uh, refinement to our brand strategy as a shared brand. So today, across all digital print uh, properties, you know, websites, social media, you'll see the word Imburse in front of every brand. So Imburse Certify, Imburse Chrome River, and Burst Nexania. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, we want customers not to notice any disruption to their business. So uh, we've had customers sort of embrace Imburse if you will. And the uh, part two to the, the question is, 
They're actually not the same customers. We have a tailored strategy whereby we have small business, medium business, large business, uh, nonprofits, Europe-based uh, brands. And so we let the customer uh, best fit select the product. And we're keeping all these brands over time. And what we're doing is introducing all new products under the Imburse Master Brand. So Imburse Cards, for example, or Imburse Pay, our payment uh, products and uh, and so forth. Uh, Inverse services uh, uh, like Inverse audit. And so over time, in the next couple of years, when it's a fully a master brand, you know, it's Inverse invoice or Inverse pay, uh, customers will have had the experience of being on this journey with us and there'll be no disruption to the business, which is really one of our overriding goals. Yeah, I mean, that's the key thing with all of this is, I know a lot of marketers are in a rush to get this done. It's like, rip the Band-Aid, let's go. The The problem is, you these companies have loyalty and people are loyal to the brand and, and the people at that brand. And you just, it's not an instant transference. And it's interesting to me, I interviewed, uh, uh, Ann Lunas, uh, the CMO of Adobe, right after they had purchased both Magento and Marketo, two, you know, both of them at four billion dollar acquisitions. And I asked her, "So, are you a house of brand? A house of brands or a branded house?" And she said, "No, we're a branded house. But if you watch what they're doing, they are migrating. They are not walking away from either Marketo or Magento anytime soon." So, what you're describing makes makes a lot of sense to me. You you do it methodically. You bring Bring them along. Okay, so what's the hardest part about this migration for you, the CMO? Well, the hardest part is really bringing everybody together at the formulation stage of the strategy. You know, some some of our uh, what we call now product lines have founders in them, and they 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 came up with their baby, that name, right? And they don't want to see that name go away. Their customers have, you know, uh, become advocates of that brand. So we find ways, both from a visual identity. Uh, where we have a, a color palette that each of the product lines has its own distinct color, helps it feel you know, a little bit more unique and brings that heritage forward. But getting the stakeholders around this, um, having internal coordination, making sure folks follow a very comprehensive brand guideline that my team put into place, what's in brand, what's out of brand, what's acceptable, what's not, and making sure that we can have a consistent brand identity and brand expression across all touch points so that over time we build the equity at the inverse level and we sort of lift up the, the existing equities and uh, those can accrue to the benefit of inverse over time. So I'm sort of imagining all these sort of parallel streams, but eventually they're merging into the Mississippi. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, you think about software integration, you know, think of an Oracle, you mentioned larger companies, Adobe. And over time, you're not going to have one user interface, but we're developing a more common user interface. So if you move between apps and you add a different capability, you feel like you're on the same uh, platform. You know, if you're uh, paying a bill or you're, you're scanning a, a travel expense and we all get back to travel with your phone, it looks like the same app from the app store. It's all in bursts and it's very, uh, you know, consistent for customer experience and, and those uh, understood benefits. Well, and and I go and we'll get to this, I think, in the later conversation. But there are some real benefits of this single brand. But let's move on uh, and bring up uh, Kevin Ruane, who is the CMO of precisely the star of episode two seventeen of Renegade Thinkers Unite, where we really talked a lot about the challenge that uh, that you face. So, hey, Kevin, how are you? Good, Drew. How are you? Good to I'm see you. Gr I'm great. Thank you for joining us today. Your situation is quite a bit different from Grant's in that you had to retire a brand name as part of your... So you didn't have any choice, but there's a lot of things that you had to do in a six-month period to sort of bring everybody along. Uh, can you talk about some of that? Yeah, it was, uh, it was an interesting journey. So we brought two similarly sized businesses together, a company that I was with called St. Sort, uh, a legacy mainframe business uh, around for many years uh, with the software and data business of Pitney Bowes. And so as part of that deal, we needed to uh, cease using the Pitney Bowes brand and marks you know, within six months of the close of the transaction. And so we had a little bit of a decision point to make where we felt like we needed a new brand. The, the SyncSort brand had outlived its usefulness and, and the brand permissions were kind of limited to the business we had become, which was much uh, more broader with a richer set of data management offerings. 
Um, so we were either going to have to have an interim step of transitioning the Pitney Bowes brand into the Sinkstore brand and then ultimately to the new brand, or we could take a really aggressive approach and in a very intense time frame, uh, move both of those uh, towards a, a, a new brand, which is what we did precisely. And so, but so th this is really interesting because suddenly now you have no equity, <laughs> right? Correct. I mean, you had Sinksort and you had Pitney Bowes. So what did this mean? What did you have to do to sort of try to go from literally zero to whatever you had with Sinksort and whatever you had with Pitney Bowes? Yeah. And then the, on top of that, Drew, you had both of those businesses had grown through acquisition. So there were a number of legacy brands that sat underneath them. And I think it's a lot of what you and Grant were just speaking about, which is it's taking a gradual approach. We had to really understand from that customer's perspective, from the market's perspective, you know, what is the equity of those brands that exist? And so the way that we've approached it was to try to, you know, find a thoughtful and simple way to establish some product brand families. And so what we did was we've matched up the precisely name with some of those product brands that had a particular uh, amount of equity and that, that, you know, our customers really had used and loved for, for many, many years because the products were great and worked and because they got great support from the businesses um, that had, you know, put those products into market. Um, and we were trying to really make that connection between things like Precisely and a brand like Trillium, which has been 15 years a leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for data quality products, to make that connection uh, to sort of gradually bring you know those customers along for you know for the journey um, and start to build that you know brand equity in Precisely as a, a brand that stands for something great and is backed by you know proven products and expertise that that works. So as I recall from our podcast, I mean, you had hundreds of little products in there, in that mix. We right? do. And we've we've got 150 products today in the portfolio, and many of them are kind of sub-products within some of these larger brands. Which is just, again, it is so challenging uh, from a marketing standpoint, in particularly in B2B, to, when you're competing with larger brands often, right, mm -hmm. to have all these brands. So what... Uh, how did you decide, I mean, were there some brands that you just sort of said, okay, we can, it's okay, we can sort of let this one go? And how did you make that decision? Yeah, we, we really looked and took a, a focused, hard look at how we're going to market. And each year we establish about a dozen, focus, we call them our focus sales plays, which are the go-to-market motions around particular uh, sets of products where we kind of make our bets and put the weight of our sales and marketing efforts behind. And so we really started there. What are your growth products? What are the... Uh, kind of the the ones that, you know, are, are most likely to help you achieve plan for the year and over the next few years. And so we kind of started there. So there are kind of a long tail of, of products that, you know, still work or still used very successfully by customers um, that we put a little bit less focus on. And it's okay to let them sort of have their legacy names and brand and, and continue to drive the value that they drive for our customers. Uh, but the ones that we're marketing on the website and doing our PR around and uh, really trying to make noise in the market with, that's where we really wanted to prioritize. And I think it comes down to about 20 or 25 sort of key products uh, that get then wrapped into uh, a smaller set of, of product brand families. So, so 25 out of 150. So there's some product managers out there who there's 125 of them, if you will, that are going, where's the love? Uh, you know, they, they've got to be on, okay, we're not that important. I mean, how do you sort of, it? Uh, that's part one of this question. Part two of this question is, from a web standpoint, do those brands disappear? They don't, you can't find them on the on the Precisely website? Correct, yeah. So I, what I would say is with some of those product managers, Drew, I may not be their most favorite person <laughs> in the world, but that's okay. That's, you know, that's the job I've signed up for. You know, I think what we've tried to do, Drew, is we try to kind of take a look at it from the customer's perspective and the market's perspective. And what you find is a lot of these products actually boil down to a set of capabilities that, that customers are looking for. So if you more market around the trends and the capabilities, um, you can kind of group things together logically. So while you may not see that product or, or kind of legacy brand name on the website, you'll see content and materials that speak to the value it can deliver uh, for customers in the broader context of you know, their data management environments. And so you know, I think we're trying to change the rules a little bit because what we found is there wasn't going to be an approach, especially we're in a private equity backed model that kind of you know, drives focus and, 
and you know trade-offs. And so we knew we needed to kind of change the game because there was no way that it would scale to support 150 products. And you know, quite frankly, trying to jam that on a website was going to just cause confusion. And, and one of the things we find is one of our big opportunities is a cross-sell opportunity. So the more simple we can make it for customers who have a product and love that product to explore other pieces of the portfolio, that's a winning formula for us. Right. And it, it just simplifies it for everybody. Yeah, I, you know, all of this, and, and I know this sounds ridiculously simple, and we're going to move on to talk to, to to Josh now, but the the thing that it just, the purpose of a brand name is essentially to say, hey, you can trust this product. <laughs> That's it, right? And and so the attachment to that name is is the attachment is is trust. So uh, anyway, and so if you have a bunch of names, you're just making life more difficult. And it's like, oh, wait, what do I do with Is it this one or is that one? All right. But anyway, let's bring on Josh, who's patiently uh, been waiting in in the batter's box here. Uh, so Josh Leatherman, CMO of Service Express, star of episode 179 of Renegade Thinkers Unite. So Josh, how are you? I'm well, Drew. Thanks for having me. Yes, and and I you're you're not quite the last thing before we get to the gin tasting. So I, I don't want you to feel like you need to rush to that because I know both of us are anxious to get to that. Uh, but anyway. What is your situation when it comes to sort of legacy brands uh, in in terms of where where Service Express is? Yeah, so um, so first of all, brand acquisition at Service Express is exclusively through M and A. So we've acquired a few domestic brands, and uh, in January we announced our first international acquisition. So we're kind of walking through that right now. Most of the brands have been around since the uh, mid 80s or early 90s. Our philosophy is this. It may sound simple, but it's actually pretty hard in practice, particularly when you're private equity backed and uh, they have an M&A uh, you know, strategy. Good acquisitions make great brands. Bad acquisitions make bad brands. Some of the best investments we've made for the growth of Service Express are the acquisitions that we walked away from. The best marketers can do very little to overcome a bad acquisition, right? It's like putting lipstick on a pig. Yeah. Uh, so we start by ensuring the selection process for new brands aligns well with our, our culture as a company and our customer first obsession. So interesting. So in other words, so that, and I'm I'm trying to make sure I understand this. You want to acquire customers that companies that have good brand value, if you will, that there's equity in that. Okay, so we've acquired brands that have equity because if they don't have equity, there's probably other problems, right? They're probably relationship issues and other things, and it's a very transactional uh, kind of situation. Okay, so then. Now they're part of ServiceNow. What are you doing with those brands? Uh, Service Ex Express. So, I'm sorry, Service uh, Express. Yeah, Pardon me. <laughs> that, that's okay. But I'll tell you, Service Express has integrations through ServiceNow with our Express Connect product. So we're big fans of ServiceNow. Um, so first, um, what do we go through when we consolidate the brand? So first we take our time. Our philosophy is don't break anything. They're good brands. Again, we're highly selective in the brands we bring on. They've got good equity, so don't break anything. Uh, as soon as we announce an acquisition, we co-brand, right? So we put a lot of resources behind announcing a new acquisition. There's press releases, there's earned media, social campaigns, customer communication. We don't want to lose the asso association that we've created in the PR initiative between the two brands. So we co-brand right away. Uh, everything from social profiles to email signatures to customer billing statements, we make sure that we leverage uh, those opportunities to build the association of brands. Uh, from there, we're looking at two things. One is story, right? So for every good acquisition, the Service Express story evolves, even if in nuance. Uh, the acquisition, strengthens how we can serve our customers. Uh, it increases our capabilities, be it features, geographically, whatever. So we wanna understand and articulate how the story has evolved. Uh, you can, we do that oftentimes through traditional brand architecture. In number two, we look at segments. How has our segments changed? Are there new ICPs or ideal customer profiles to go after? 
new accounts or prospects, verticals to go after. We go to work on defining the new total addressable market that the brand will need to build uh, awareness and affinity for. And so with this, and so in really interesting to me, and there's so many things I want to dive into on, on that. Uh, so a lot of the things that you said make a lot of sense, and I had just hadn't thought of them in necessarily that order, but how that acquisition account uh, enhances your story. Can you give an example, a specific example of that with one of the acquisitions that you did in the last six months to a year? Yeah, so uh, our, our most recent acquisition is Blue Chip. It's our first international one. They are based in the UK. Blue Chip opens up, um, you know, uh, additional services that we can offer that provide provide great value to our customers. Um, they've got some intellectual property there that we can leverage and build into the story. So we're kind of working through understanding exactly how that translates to our domestic customers and how what we do translates to our international customers now with Blue Chip. In an ideal world, obviously, the acquisition strategy is that one plus one equals three. So there's some cross-sell, upsell, expanded. So now that you have an international, in theory, if you had a customer that wanted to go international, you could service them in, in a way that you couldn't before. Right. Uh, so this all sounds methodical and great, um, but at what point do you say we're investing, still investing in brand that we acquired a few years ago and our, we're starting, our dollars are getting diluted? When do you sort of, at what, how, how do you make sure that we are still building one big brand versus lots of little brands? Yeah, so we, Service Express is a platform brand. We are a platform company, right? So we focused on building the best company and the best brand that we can. Uh, our goal is to make sure, and when you've built a good brand like Service Express, it's easier to move companies from legacy brands or brands that they love to a company that people are excited about, right? It was when Disney bought Pixar, right? It was easier um, that Disney has great properties, Pixar has great properties. It was easier for Disney to bring them over because they had built a really good platform company and a master brand. Yeah. Um, so uh, off, oftentimes also we start with a customer, not the marketing. Uh, when moving a customer from one brand to another, uh, we try to identify quick wins with them. Nothing builds credibility more for a brand than identifying areas the new brand can provide immediate value. Uh, and that's not just marketing, right? It's marketing making sure that we've got a seat at the table, but service plays a role in this, sales plays a role in this, product plays a role in this. We've got to make sure that we bring all the teams together. Got it. Okay. All right. Well, this is a great moment. If, if, if you don't mind, listeners, I'd like to plug CMO Huddles for a second. CMO Huddles was launched in 2020, and it's an invitation-only subscription service that brings together an elite group of CMOs to share, care, and dare each other to greatness. One CMO described a huddle as a cross between an expert workshop and a therapy session. Grant, Kevin, Josh, do anything you want to add about CMO huddles from your experience? Uh, I would just add, um, you know, that that's how you grow as a, as a CMO. I love CMO huddles because um, at Service Express, we do a lot of R&D, which is rip off and duplicate. We learn what's working really well at other companies, what other great CMOs are doing. We, we understand what's applicable to us, and we bring it back to our organization. And CMO huddles is a great way to do some R&D. I love it. I'm going to have to use that as like marketing. This CMO huddles, come for R&D. <laughs> um, Grant, Kevin, anything else you want to throw in there while we're here? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's an intense you know, therapy session, but I would say that, you know, it's a really high caliber group of, you know, very passionate CMOs committed to their business and to helping each other. And so we can uh, share best practices as challenge and try new ideas out and actually uh, don't try things that have already proven not to work. So it's very pragmatic and, and helpful. Love it. Love it. Love it. All right. Uh, uh, Kevin, don't want to put you I'm on the spot here. So, uh, 
<laughs> happy to happy to just agree with with Josh and, and with Grant. It's HTML huddles has been terrific, and it's the connections you make, and it's not just connecting on the huddles, but it's the, some of the connections you can make on the sidelines. There's no topic that you could want to dive deeper into that there's not someone with great expertise who's happy to share it. So it's been terrific, Drew. There. There you go. Okay, cool. All right. Well, we're moving on. And what we're talking about now is this with all, all of us is the notion of brand consolidation. And it's interesting, Josh mentioned Disney. And if you go to the Disney channel, you actually see they are, and they have been for a long time, a house of brands. There's Disney, but there's ABC, there's Marvel, there's Pixar. And they have not walked away from those brands because those brands have tremendous equity. And also Disney has some, you know, Disney itself, both as a parent brand and as, as its own brand has its own limitations. So in B2B, however, where you're fighting for every little bit of share of voice that you can have, let's just talk about why it's so important that we get to brand consolidation and why you're, Kevin, trying to build precisely and, and, and why Grant is trying to build and burst. What's so important about building these solitary brands? Yeah, I mean, I, I would add, Drew, I think it's just there's only so many resources that you have. And if you, you know, spread them too thin and across too many areas, you just won't make an impact. Even some of the most notable names in, in our industry, uh, you know, they fight for and have to, to really uh, fight for that mind share. I mean, it's a noisy marketplace. And so, um, you know, if you can't get that focus to make, you know, one brand stand for something great and, and really put your energy and, and resources behind it, it's going to be a really tough road. So, you know, there's, I think, just a simplicity of it, a focus that, you know, kind of that brings. And, you know, for a business like ours, it really is what's necessary to unlock that cross-sell opportunity that we exi think exists between our customers. So it also really aligns to support the strategy. I, I agree with Kevin. More brands mean more resources that can detract from demand marketing activities and the growing list of priorities that uh, marketing is responsible or on the field for. And I just think the volume and velocity of new brands that are being created. I, our buyer is the IT buyer. It's amazing how many new companies and new brands are popping up in, in an attention economy where consumers are just inundated with so many brands. Uh, it can be difficult for anyone to keep them straight. And so I think it's important for companies really to, to put as much of their resources behind as few brands as they possibly can. Yeah, and Grant, anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all in violent agreement. And, you know, one of the philosophies I formed a long time ago is in branding, especially in tech branding, B2B branding, is you want to make it easier for customers to make choices, to understand your offering. We, we've all talked about ICP and value props. And so if you've got this, you know, proliferation of brands and their confusion and overlapping, you're making it harder for customers. We all want to win in the marketplace. So simplify actually increases sales from a brand new perspective. And I just, it's so important. Can we pause on it? Simplify improves brand sales opportunities. Um, I just want, just in case anybody listening does not know what an ICP is, it's ideal customer profile. Now, is there a downside to the, the branded house approach? Have you, have you lost any customers because you sort of retired a brand? I, you know, I can say we as as we've retired brands, we've not lost um, we've not lost customers. But um, again, we've taken our time with it, right? We've we followed the lead of the customer uh, and the brand that we've acquired. So we have not experienced uh, really any loss of customers. Interesting. Um, yeah, and I'm sure that's not something that you necessarily would want to even talk about. Um, I, you know, one of the ways that I, I think people hope will happen is in these sub brands will sort of represent a certain segment of the market, uh, but it just gets clumsy, right? I mean, from a site architecture standpoint, and and I think the thing that uh, that Grant mentioned is this, or this is all about time and the absence of it, right? We just don't have that much time to, you know, carve out a share of brain 
uh, with our target audiences. So yeah, we're a big believer in the in the branded uh, branded house approach and and trying to consolidate even in these circumstances. All right, this is a perfect place for us to take a break. Let's get back to the topic at hand and let's start with some mistakes to avoid when we're cut. You know, anybody have some uh, things they can share in this area? What are some mistakes that you've seen that can happen? I, I think for me, Drew, it's it's the timing piece we were talking about earlier. It, it really is. It, and for me, there's not sort of a one size fits all formula. You know, there's it, it's kind of knowing when to retire a brand versus when to continue to bring folks along for that journey and, and kind of, uh, you know, make that transition. Um, and to me, you know, there have been times where maybe it's felt like we've moved a little bit faster than we should have. Uh, and then there are times where, you know, especially in a highly acquisitive environment, Josh can probably speak to this, where you don't move fast enough. And then this sort of brand debt builds up over time as well. So just trying to find that right balance of, of the timing is, you know, for me, the, the struggle that I wish there was a better formula for. Well, and then let's dig into that. I mean, uh, do you, do you uh, just you uh, or or Grant? Do you have how do you sort of are you looking at brand tracking and you're seeing one the number going up here for your main brand and the number? I mean, how do you sort of assess this moment of okay, we can retire now? Yeah. So f from our perspective, is you know we, we kind of work with the acquired brand, right? And we set a time frame and then we over communicate. We over communicate with internal stakeholders and we over communicate with um, with the customers of the acquire brand. So everybody knows that, first of all, the brand association has been built and it's not a surprise to anyone when the website changes over, when the the uh, logo on the masthead changes over. It's not a surprise to anyone. So we over communicate. Yeah. Uh, so there's a there's a big rule. No surprises for your customers. And that's the thing in these things. It feels like the customer can easily get lost. Right. The P.E. firms are building up value. So what can they do for it? They can sell the company off so the customer can get lost. And that feels like something. Grant, any thoughts on other avoids uh, mistakes to be made or when you know it's time? Yeah, I I think it was touched on before that, you know, you you communicate to all the customers you have them become part of the larger entity, um, and you want to be open-minded. I, I remember one uh, brand integration I did where, you know, we only had in our color palette a blue and yellow, kind of boring, and you know they had a more vibrant uh, purple. And so, well, hey, we could amend the color palette. We've got a much richer color palette with Embers, and so by design, we wanted to include these seven brands that they had some ex expression. But if you want to bring the people along from the acquired company. And so you just want to be sensitive, as the others have said, about, you know, timing and communication and making them feel part of the larger whole because they can imbue some additional, you know, associations and energy to your brand that you want to uh, leverage. You know, it's funny. We haven't talked about employees in this uh, a lot other than and and you're right that those employees that you did want to keep through the consolidation, their connection, at least their door in uh, was to the uh, acquired brand that now you're saying all the shirts that they have and hats that they have are, are no longer uh, 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 sort of relevant or, or their relics. So employees are a big part of this. Customers are a big part of this. Um, so. When we get to the website, and this is really an interesting one and I need your opinion on, you've got, let's say you've acquired two brands in the last uh, six months and you are looking and you've, you've got to map out a website strategy and you're thinking that your goal is to have one website. Uh, what? Are, how do you make sure that you don't lose you know, your customers and the SEO value uh, from the sites that are being retired? That, that's exactly what we're going through now, Drew. And um, so first of all, we will not do it on our own. It's a mistake that I see companies much larger than us making. Um, you know, Google is like the stock market. Its data is changing every day and someone needs to be kind of finely attuned to those changes and, and what it means for the website. Uh, Service Express is benefiting from years of SEO equity that that we and, and our teams have built and it's like compound interest only time gives you the gift of that equity and as marketers we have 
kind of a fiduciary responsibility not to break that, not to wreck it, right? And so we will work with people who are experts, who understand, um, you know, custom redirects, the importance of that, the backlink strategy, short tail keywords, long tail keywords, what it means for the website uh, integration. We will not do that by ourselves. Right. So you need an ex outside expert. Um, and, I, and I'm curious if any of you have done this uh, where you didn't lose a step <laughs> because almost every relaunch of a website is uh, ends up with some SEO dip. But have you had a success case where you ended up, you ended a website, you merged it with yours, you did all the redirects and, and you didn't lose any site traffic? I can't say I have, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> it's that hard, right? It's that right. hard. So chances are you're going to give, you're going to lose something. It's just a question of not losing everything and protecting that equity. Any other thoughts, uh, gents, on on making sure that, because this, the SEO value is, is yeah, it really is, it's money in the bank uh, that uh, you, you can lose. Any other thoughts on how you can uh, keep that and and yet eliminate websites yeah drew you know what we have found is and, and this is a little bit of a generalization you know typically we've done this quite a bit and we like to merge into one website you know for us today it's the precisely.com site we usually find that there's a, a core set of pages that are doing the most work for a website and so you know again utilizing some of the expertise outside expertise that uh that josh mentioned and as well as some of the folks that i'm fortunate to have on my team we do a pretty good job of focusing in and getting a handle on what those pages are. And then our strategy has been to recreate those pages in terms of topics and keywords on our new site and then redirect from the old pages to kind of signal to Google, you know, this is where this great content you've been rewarding is going to permanently live going forward. And so it's not perfect. I, I agree with Grant. You always give a little bit, but you know, I feel like, you know, at some point you kind of have to take your medicine and then you start to get that cumulative effect and, and the benefit over time. And you've seen it at some point in time, in theory, you're going to have, you're going to be stronger because you did this consolidation, but you're going to take a hit is, is basically what you're saying. And part of that is, Kevin, as you're describing it, it sounds like you get 70 or 80 percent of the goodness from the old site, but you're going to lose it because some of that's just so long tail stuff. You can't do it all. That's exactly right, Drew. And, you know, I think over time you start to kind of catch up and you hope you build from there. But but absolutely right. You know, I, I think there's just a little bit of a reality, at least in my experience, that you, you have to face and, and you take that medicine and then you start building back from there. But you can you know, you can preserve. I mean, you really can preserve a good chunk of that value with a thoughtful approach. Um, you know, like some of the things Josh was mentioning. Right. Uh, OK, so let's say you've acquired um, one of these brands that's in your portfolio and you're just not sure how strong it is. And, and I, I'm wondering how you go about assessing and and measuring the strength of these brands so you make sure. Um, and I, I'm curious, Grant, what your your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of ways to do it. Um, we've actually developed a proprietary framework because we're trying to bring the, the brands along to where they help us build equity and embrace. Um, You know, you can do it formally by, you know, talking to customers directly, uh, unaided, aided awareness testing, brand tracking testing. But you can also do what I call a proxy for measuring it. You, you look at a variety of things around awareness and, and perception, uh, coverage, uh, reach, engagement. And so that's what we've done. We've, we've amalgamated those various measurements and have an overall quarterly tracker. And then we can see, you know, what goes up, what goes down. And to your point, Drew, if, if uh, you start to see uh, the overall in burst go up and say one of the sub brands, you know, is diminished as long as the aggregate is higher, then it gives you a little more confidence, uh, you know, especially as other customers are adopting the brand in house, the master brand, that uh, you can move away from that one a little bit more quickly. But you do want to have some objective measures in, in addition to subjective judgment. Interesting. Okay, so you have a brand health proxy, which is made up of a number of fairly easy to measure things, whether it's site traffic or share of PR, 
um, or uh, maybe it's some site traffic to pages, but whatever yeah, those yeah, little yeah, proxies score, are. score, customer set. There's lots of ways that you can get a sense of your brand affiliation and strength. Exactly. Right. Okay. And then you track those. And then in an ideal world, you see one go up and one go down, um, but the the net is is higher. And therefore, uh, you can sort of start to say, oh, okay, we're, we're, we're doing what we uh, set out to do. Any other thoughts on that, Kevin or um, Josh? Yeah, we're probably not quite as sophisticated as Grant is. We we rely very heavily on our customers and going out and speaking to customers. You know, um, you know, we do some surveys of kind of customers and you know prospective customers as well, um, just to to get a sense. But um, yeah, that's probably been kind of the approach that we've taken. Right. And and Josh. Uh, yeah, I would agree with Grant. I think qualitative feedback is just so important. Too often we try and find all these objective right, metrics and, and those are helpful and they're useful, but quality, your customers will tell you, right, if a brand is frustrating, if it's confusing, if it's not defined. The, the problem with metrics, um, objective metrics, is it's like asking um, how much smoke is in the bar, right? Do you, do you measure it by the number of smokers by the number of cigarettes in the ashtray, by the number of ashtrays on the table. All those different ways can help to measure it, but you really have to kind of settle on one and um, or two. Digital reputation is important for us. Gartner Peer Insights, um, you know, Glassdoor, our, you know, reputation online is very important because that's voice of the customer, but I would never neglect the qualitative uh, side of things by just getting in front of customer, customers and asking. Um, and by the way, is it good to have smoke in the barn or bad to have smoke in the barn as we're measuring bar, this? The bar. The, the I'm bar. I'm, I'm dating myself. I see. Yeah. You could for, smoke in the bar. I knew I was missing something. All yeah. right. Well, this is the moment in the show where we ask, what would Ben Franklin say? <laughs> and here, um, one of the things I'm going to suggest is that that uh, Ben might not say rip the Band-Aid with, and based on this quote, let all things have their places. Let each of your businesses have its time. So let's not rip the Band-Aid and drop the legacy brands without at least a careful migration strategy. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ben. Uh, amazing to have you join us here. Okay. So um, we've all seen it where brands have just hung on. They're just, they just don't go away and there's still a tiny bit a uh, part of it. Uh, and, and I guess we've, we've sort of covered this idea of when you know it's time. Have you ever been in a situation currently or before where you actually retired a brand when it was a little too early? I have not, but I have been the customer of companies who have retired brands way too late or they, they did a really poor, and it taught me how not to do it. They did a really poor job of defining the roadmap for the brand uh, and it conflicted with, uh, Salesforce does a lot of great acquisitions. I don't know if I can name them here, but they do a lot of great of acquisitions. When they acquired Pardot, it was a mess. It was like their redheaded stepchild. They did not define the roadmap. Um, we didn't know if they were going to make investments in it. It was competing against their marketing cloud. And they've done tons of great acquisitions really well. So this was one that they had just missed on. And it really taught me as a customer um, that it is really important to define the brand and help the customer understand what the roadmap and investment for the brand will look like. Yeah, I think that's, by the way, really fair game uh, to talk about other companies and brands that have done it. Yeah, it's funny. And I think uh, Salesforce has been obviously a hugely acquisitive company. Uh, but it is interesting that Oracle uh, acquired Eloqua and Adobe acquired Maketo and Salesforce acquired Pardot. And, you know, these are all three uh, tools that do the same thing. And all of them, with the exception so far of Adobe and Marketo, stumbled. Um, and, and that's just so interesting. And part of it is, and this gets back to some of the things that you said, Josh, is the community. I went to Marketo Nation. I, I danced with these people for hours. And, and this is a really fun, connected group. They believe they're Marketoans. I mean, they are part of this 
uh, community. And so to take away that would be because they've been trained, they've been certified, they're part of it is a big deal. And I think that's part of this affinity that we've sort of been talking about. And, and that's really an amazing state to get to as a brand is to have this kind of affinity. Very few brands get there. So I, anyway, that just a, an observation in this. And, and I wonder from your standpoint, gents, if you've seen in some of the brands, even the smaller ones, where you have that kind of sort of dedication to the brand, where there's really a true community built around it. I've got an interesting one for you, Drew. So we formed a partnership several years ago with IBM supporting their business to business integration products. So we do some development and, and support work with them. Um, and they had moved uh, for that line of products to, it was the time where the Watson brand was so hot and all the rage. And so they had branded it Watson. Um, and since we've been working with them over the last couple of years, they've actually gone back to the brand of Sterling, which was the original uh, name of the product line because the customers just never could move on from it. They love that brand. And um, it's been one of the, the strategies that's really made that kind of a healthy and thriving uh, product line by bringing it back to Sterling and, and moving on from Watson, despite that being all the rage not too long ago. And and you suspect that's because there was a strong community. I can't remember what Sterling did, uh, but because uh, they had they had also acquired like Sh Sugar CRM, I think was their sort of uh, Eloqua type product. What was Sterling? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, so this is particularly the business to business collaboration and integration okay. products. Right, um, right, right. But and, and it, it was just a, you know, it, a great, it's a great product. And, you know, the customers who used it, it, it worked and they loved it and they just really didn't want to let go of it. And, um, you know, I think to, to IBM's credit, um, you know, they recognized that and they made the shift back and have, have certainly benefited from that. It's so interesting because IBM is sort of this I mean, it is it is the ultimate in, if you think about uh, branded house, I mean, that uh, house of brand, uh, no, branded house. I mean, they have made everything, every acquisition becomes, and they have a whole sort of blue washing group that comes in and builds a, around it. Uh, and I just, but yeah, so there was a case where the Sterling brand was stronger than IBM. That's fascinating. Well, well I've got an IBM antidote because I was acquired by IBM in 2006 at FileNet. And, and exactly you say, Blue Wash, it says, we're going to take your website away in six months. You're not doing a billion revenue. You're not at low to stability level. And therefore, you're going to go away. I said, well, that's OK. Uh, I was talking with the CEO. But, you know, we're producing 2,000 leads. <laughs> you know, do you, do you want those to go away? So fast forward, 18 months later, the, the website was merged. They weren't going to do it in six months because there are those pragmatic considerations, as you said, Drew, about community and customers and demand you're generating, you just can't simply merge and, you know, it all becomes additive. Uh, yes, exactly. It becomes additive. I mean, the whole, it's just fascinating. I mean, and this is why this is so challenging. And I wanted to talk about this. You acquire these companies because you want the business value, right? What you want are their customers. <laughs> what the customers want are is, is the connection that they had to the brand and obviously the product or service. It's so fascinating because they're, the, the 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 goals are not necessarily aligned in any given acquisition. All right. So let's say that we've started to get rid of some of these brands. How are you making sure that your prospects and customers can still differentiate? Because you still have these offerings that were named that. So how do you, I, I mean, what's the branding strategy or sub-brand strategy? Uh, you know, is it all just descriptions, descriptive names? Yeah, I think, Drew, that's what we've tried to do is we've tried to just be clear about what the products are and what they do and, you know, trying to align as best as we can to some of the industry terms that the analysts and, and others use. And, and again, speaking more to the capabilities that align to the, the needs of the customers and the, the market trends. OK, so go ahead. Yeah, anybody else? Yeah, I would just add one of the things that I've done that I found that's helped is to create a brand hierarchy and naming conventions. And so in addition to, you know, what products are at the brand level and what are at the descriptive level that, you know, you might have a number of sub brands and the, and the master brand, and then everything else is, you know, sort of at a, at a different hierarchy at level, because, you know, us as consumers and our customers can retain, you know, maybe a couple of levels, right? So everything, you can't have, you know, 20 things being equal. So as, you know, Josh mentioned earlier, you, you, and I, you know, Kevin as well, so you, you have to have this, you know, 
priority, where are you going to get the revenue from, where's your growth, and get behind those brands or those product lines. But everything needs some logical structure. Again, helping customers make decisions to differentiate, choose your products, choose among your products, all that I think helps. Yeah, and it's it's funny. I, I'm, I've been on uh, B2B websites where I'll see brand, I'll see a secondary brand, and then I'll see a feature that's branded. And I'm thinking, wait, wait, what are, this is like going back to the days of certs and a sparkling drop of Retson. I mean, where you and, and you just as a as a B2B customer, you just can't get there. Uh, I mean, you, you, you can get there, but you, you want to get rid of it because it's not helping you. All right. So we're going to we're going to recap now with some of the biggest lessons learned just real quick. Uh, Grant, lead us off. What are sort of in this process for you? What's the biggest lessons learned? Well, bringing everybody along on this journey. So first of all, internal, you, you know, you have to have a realistic, you know, consolidation, integration, timeline. As was said earlier, communicate, you know, over communicate. You need to celebrate milestones and successes. You want to reinforce uh, the progress you've made and, you know, make sure customers are to coming along with you on that journey. And so they'll embrace your change. And actually change management itself is something not to underestimate uh, because we all get comfortable, just like with friends, with brands. And so just bring the, the, the groups along, all the stakeholders together in an iterative fashion. Yeah. Uh, uh, Josh, uh, lessons learned. Yeah, I think the big one is brand strategy. Brand integration is not done and should not be done in the boardroom. Um, there are so many more stakeholders that you need to bring along. And we've talked a lot about timing, collaboration and communication. Right. And so um, making sure that marketing is leading the charge in this collaborative process and not kind of railroading or just coming up with a, a planned uh, independently. And it's also about quick wins. What are quick wins that um, continue to build equity within the brand for customers, for employees of acquired companies? Like, how can we be helpful instead of just coming in and being a, a bull in a china shop? Right. And I love the comment about the boardroom. It's so important because you've made the acquisition. Let's rip the bandaid. Let's do it. We'll put it on a three month timetable and go. And we know that's that's problematic. All right, uh, Kevin, last licks. Yeah, get I mean, get customers, get employees, get partners involved early and often. Let them in on the secret. You know, in the case of precisely when we revealed a, a new name, um, let them in on the secret. People want to be in the know. Um, and just no surprises with customers, you know, bring them along for the journey. Um, you don't want to put a shock to the system. Um, you want to, you know, reap the benefits of, of getting everyone behind the effort and building that excitement and momentum. And you can do that in a way that doesn't, you know, wreck any kind of a big reveal. Um, it, it can actually generate a lot of momentum and, and good goodwill and feeling for people out of the gates. I love it. All right. Well, we're going to we're going to bring our customers along. Uh, we're going to bring our employees along and we're going to do this uh, methodically and uh, and we're going to make sure that it's um, a little bit of fun, too. All right. Thank you, Grant, Kevin and Josh. You guys are great sports. Thank you, audience, for staying with us. All right. Cue the music. Renegade Thinkers Live is produced by Melissa Caffrey. Our botanical expert is Nicole Hernandez. For show notes and past episodes, please visit renegade.com, home of quite possibly the savviest B2B marketing agency in New York City. I'm your host, Drew Neiser. And until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong.